Good evening, everyone. I want to share with you a couple of ideas that help me when I'm studying. Because I've had people ask me this week a very scary question. How's your brain work? <laughs> that is a scary question. And I've been mulling that over, and I think the answer is going to go right into the lesson tonight, the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes as the Attributes of God. And there are various tools that are very important for studying. Uh, some people are great at dissecting the text. Some people are great at languages. There's two things that I use a lot, and, and they help me. Maybe they're not as valuable as some of the others, but they help me. And it goes right into today's lesson. There are two tools I want to encourage you to use but not to abuse in studying the Bible. The first one is curiosity. I am really good at asking questions. We know little kids are really good at asking questions, right? Their favorite word after they learn it is, why? And you try to explain why. You give them a second reason, why? And after a while you just say, because I said so, then they ask, why? And sometimes, why is absolutely right. Sometimes, when we get to be older, we uh, stop asking why. I want you to keep asking yourself why. And then the other one is imagination. Trying to put yourself in the place of the characters. We did that a little bit in our Sunday morning class, but trying to use imagination to flesh out in between words and try to understand tone and things like that. It helps me. Now, that doesn't mean that imagination and curiosity are more important than text, but it means that it helps me figure out what is in the text. And asking the question, why, is kind of where I went with the lesson tonight. We've been studying the Sermon on the Mount, been looking at the Beatitudes, and I asked myself the question, why does Jesus begin the Sermon on the Mount with those Beatitudes? Because I could think of a lot more that are a whole lot easier to understand that truly are the gospel. Why not, for example, blessed are those dead in sin, for they will be given life and forgiveness. Blessed are those with no hope, for they will be given a future beyond imagination. Blessed are those defeated and beaten down, for those will be lifted up to rule in God's kingdom. Those are pretty good, aren't they? They're all the gospel. Why did he begin with things such as, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, are gentle, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, are merciful, pure in heart, are peacemakers and persecuted for righteousness' sake. Why does Jesus Christ begin with these beatitudes, which culminates in the end of the first section with... Matthew chapter 5 and verse 48, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Is there any connection whatsoever to the Beatitudes, to this command, to this encouragement to be like our heavenly Father? So I started asking, why? Now I want to take you on a journey. Let's ask the question, what is God? There's a lot of different ways you could answer that question, and we're going to delve into them. But according to the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which is used for the layman and parents to teach their children what is God, the fourth question is what is God, and the answer is that children are supposed to memorize God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in His being, 
Wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Woo! How many of you understand all of that? And this is what parents are supposed to teach their children. This is what the laymen, you know, those that are not educated and didn't go to theological uh, school and seminary are supposed to understand. Now, I, I, I would look at all that and say, yeah, that, that, that's God. There's a lot of different ways that you could define what is God. And when we say what are God, we're asking what are his attributes, what are his characteristics. And one that very many people are familiar with is one I will just refer to as scripturally, God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verses 8 and 16, God is love. Three words, and yet it is deeper probably than we'll ever understand because we really can't understand the depth of God's love. I did a, a sermon on, on agape love, which is, is right here, and I came to a fascinating uh, conclusion that the word agape in the time before Jesus Christ did not have the same meaning that it had in the New Testament. In fact, you remember when um, Amnon was lusting after his half-sister, Tamar, and said that he loved, hated her with a greater hate than he loved her in the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament. It uses the word agape for love. Well, that's definitely not the agape of the New Testament. But what we find is that God took a word that they were accustomed to and instead of defining it through a dictionary, defined it through a life. Jesus Christ redefined what agape is. That's how deep that word is. And since it means to seek the best for another, it even explains somewhat, and it's an argument for what we call the, the trinity. Because how can you seek the best for another if there is not another? So there always had to be a plurality within the singularity that God is one, yet three. That's how deep this is. We could look at other words theologically. Attributes such as omnipresence, which means all everywhere, omnipotent, all power, omniscience. All knowledge, I just call these the all everything attributes of God. And none of those words are found in the Bible, but all the ideas are. Okay. Trying to understand those are kind of hard to get your head around. How can God know everything, be omniscient, and yet give us free will? That is a fascinating discussion that we're not going into tonight. I love things like that. But what is God? Well, there are little lists that you look at if you go into Wikipedia, which is not, it's not always wrong. Uh, and you can see that he is, he has a saity. Okay, I had to look that one up and I have a degree in philosophy, okay? It means self-existent. Okay, that's, that's true. Immutability, cannot change. Well, that depends on what you mean cannot change because God changed his mind when people prayed to him. And yet, Hebrew says God cannot change. So it's, again, something that makes you go, what's going on here? Who is this God that we worship? I'm not sure I can understand him. And then you got the, the paradoxical aspect. He's transcendent. That means he's way up there. He's in heaven, yet imminent, as Paul talked in Acts chapter 17, how God is near all of us. So here is how you describe who God is, what God is. But we don't see this in the Sermon on the Mount. We see throughout the Bible traits from God that cannot be imitated because they describe God from the point of view of his abilities, omnipotence, and what he isn't. He does not have a beginning. Now, how many of you can uh, be omnipotent? No, good. I am really glad nobody raised their hand. Or we were going to have to change the sermon entirely. 
But then you have traits of God that can be imitated, such as God is love. And when we look at God and we think about his attributes, we think about his characteristics, do you ever think about God having a personality? I think he does. We have personality. We're made in God's image. We are to become like God. That's what Matthew chapter 5, verse 48 says. But we're never going to reach what he is. He's perfection in the sense of no sin, but he's also perfection in the sense he is completeness when we are incomplete, and he completes our incompleteness. He's perfection when we are imperfect, and he perfects our imperfection. We are able to become like God in some ways because we are challenged to be like God. But that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 because we're made in whose image? God's image. So, there are things about God that we cannot imitate. But there are things that we can. And we see this throughout the Bible. And for example, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, everybody knows the love chapter. And you've probably heard this... Uh, probably more times than what you want to hear, but you're going to hear it one more time. So, God is patient, so be patient. How God is love, right? And we go through the, you know, love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, so on and so forth. And then we say, we know these are characteristics, God is love, and we say, God is patient, God is kind, does not envy. And, and then we say, now, one of our, our goals in becoming like God is to be able to put our name in the place of love. So to make tonight's lesson participatory and hopefully personal, everybody that feels comfortable enough in joining me for this, this reading, I want you to read along with me. And when it says name, do not say name. Say your name. And you see, our goal is to become like God, to love like God. And if God is patient, then we need to be like patient. And therefore, we need to be able to say, at least work on, and please read with me, Perry is patient, kind, does not envy, is not boastful, nor conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, nor provoked, does not keep a record of repented wrongs, finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and never ends loving. God is love. We can imitate love because he tells us what it is. Lifelong goal. We are told in Galatians 5 about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Well, why is it the fruit of the Spirit? We're told to walk in the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. So I suggest to you that just like love is defined in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and God is love, and that's a description of who God is that we can imitate, that when we go to Galatians chapter 5, and we see that we are to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control, that there's no way that we can walk in the Spirit and that be the fruit of the Spirit unless that is the characteristics and the attributes and the personality of the Spirit. So this describes who the Holy Spirit is, that we are to benefit from, from having in our life, and therefore bear the same fruit of who He is as He fills us. So those of you who want to join me, Perry is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. We're supposed to do all of these things. This is who the Holy Spirit is. These are just as much the attributes of the Holy Spirit. Love is just as much the attributes of God as omnipotence and omniscience, omnibenevolence, and all those omnis that there are. Well, then we come to 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're told that we need to participate in the divine nature. Well, if we're participating in the divine nature, that means that what we are to participating in 
The divine nature is God's nature. Again, who he is, his characteristics, his attributes, his personality. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God possesses goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Therefore, if I am to participate in the divine nature, I am to participate in who God is by imitating him. For those who would like to join me, Perry possesses goodness, knowledge, self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. They are so much easier to read than B, aren't they? We see in all three, love is the attribute that we can imitate. It is called the greater way and the greatest gift. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 31, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. We see that the fruit of the Spirit begins with love. And in that text in Galatians chapter 5, it says that the entire law is fulfilled in one word or one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Galatians 5 verse 15. And when we look at the divine nature, it culminates. The last one that is mentioned is love. And all of the qualities leading up to and including love will keep us from being useless and keep us from being unfruitful, and keep us from stumbling. Why? Because that's who God is. And God is useful, fruitful, and does not cause anyone to stumble. So when we look at love as the attribute, we can see this mentioned in the Sermon on the Mount, right before we see, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? We talked about reward last night. Don't even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't even the Gentiles do the same? So right after talking about love, he says, be perfect, therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now what all that verse entails might be probably is more than love, but we know it encapsulates love because it comes right after talking about love. So this is where the curiosity and imagination go. If I can find the list of imitable attributes in 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians 5 and 2 Peter 1 that are describing God and yet what we can imitate, I wondered, is there a fourth list? Maybe there's another list. And considering that the Beatitudes culminate and be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect, I started using my imagination. So here we go. <laughs> These are the questions that I asked. If the goal ultimately is to imitate God, chapter 5, verse 48, and if God fulfills the need within each beatitude, which we see is true, and he has to be able to have those attributes in order to fulfill them, if the Beatitudes help us achieve the surpassing righteousness, which is God's but not the Pharisees, then the attributes are. The Beatitudes are the attributes of God. So we're going to start at the bottom. And, and when I, I put it like this, at least when I was studying, and I use curiosity and I use imagination, this little light bulb went off, and it's like, well... There are aha moments, and then there are well duh moments, and this one became a well duh moment for me. What took me so long to see it? Because is God righteous? 
Is God a peacemaker? Is He pure in heart? Is He merciful? Yes, He is. And we see righteousness actually used twice. God is righteous. Is God gentle? Yes. Does God mourn? Yes, He does. But we are poor in spirit. And you see what we need to do before we can become like God is to first realize how we are nothing like God. Until we realize we are nothing like God, we can never become like God because we're filled with ourselves. As we talked about last night, we need to repent of who we are, being ourselves. So let's just go through some of these because I don't have time to go through all of them, but now you have some of the tools to do your own studying. Let's look at righteousness. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10, those who are persecuted, we're going backwards. Those who are persecuted for righteousness are blessed, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, one thing that we need to understand is righteousness is not solely determined by how we worship. Because God does not worship himself, and yet he is righteous. Righteousness is also how we treat people. It is a moral quality, and it is based upon we treat people even though they are undeserving, because God treats those who are undeserving with love. And he is righteous. So when we look at the eighth attribute, blessed are those who are persecuted because they are righteous, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs because God is righteous. Let's look at the seventh peacemaker. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. The peacemakers are blessed, for they will be called sons of God. See, that should have been a clue to me many years ago that being a peacemaker must be an attribute of God because it leads to me being a son of God. Our children are, are like us, right? My, my uh, oldest daughter loves to aggravate people. I'll let you guess which one she gets that from. My second daughter loves to read. That is not me at all. That is my wife. I am such a slow reader. I read one paragraph and my ADD just starts going all different directions. And our sons who are adopted, somewhere they de developed a liking for puns. You see, some things are not necessarily nature, but nurture. We're the image of God, nature. We're the image of God, nurture. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called sons of God. Peace is definitely an attribute of God. We find that he is called the God of peace. Five times, at least in this one translation, Romans 5, 33, Romans 16, 20, Philippians 4, verse 9, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, Hebrews 13, verse 20, and 12 times peace from God. Romans 1, 7, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 2 Corinthians 1, 2. You can see it's even in the introductions, right? Galatians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, Titus chapter 1, Philemon and the only chapter, chapter 1. So, is peace from God an important attribute of God that he gives to us? Yes, because so many of the letters begin with peace from God. Well, when we look at that, that's the seventh attribute in the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God, because our God, our Father, is a peacemaker. The pure in heart. The pure in heart are blessed, for they will see God. Well, let me ask you again. It's like one of those things that just kept going over my, my, my head. Uh, don't you have to be like God in order to see God? So... 
In order to see God, I need to be like him. I need to be a pure heart because he is pure in heart. And pure in heart does not just refer to sinlessness, although when we're forgiven by God, that makes us sinless. But it does refer to often how we view other people, our attitudes, our willingness to see ourselves truly. That takes purity of heart. Seeing true is not always easy to do. And we can have fun, for example, uh, a house of mirrors, you know, you go and you can be stretched real tall, you can be stretched real fat, you can be stretched real thin, and your face can look nothing like you recognize. And, and I want to suggest to you we spiritually do this. In fact, there's a particular passage that talks about looking at yourself in the mirror, James chapter 1, and forgetting what you look like. So you look at the mirror and go, what, whoa, whoa. You see my hair in the morning? People pay lots of money to make it spike like that, but I do it naturally. It sticks up, it sticks out, and I'll look. And if I tried to walk out like that because I forgot what I saw, my wife would remind me. It's easy to forget because we don't want to forget, but sometimes we're not even seeing clearly. We're just totally blind to what we are seeing. I, I, I've done that before. There is a uh, picture of me when I was a kid, and I had on a sport jacket. Red, white, and blue, and checkered. I look so good. Until I grew up and realized, I wish they'd take that down off the wall. But we're like that when we look at ourselves because we're not pure in heart. We want to see ourselves better than we are. Some of us want to see ourselves worse than we are. We need to be pure in heart, see ourselves as we truly are. 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So when we look at the sixth beatitude as an attribute, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God because God is pure. Merciful. The merciful are blessed, for they will be shown mercy. Well, who's going to show them mercy? Not always human beings, is it? It's going to be God is going to show them mercy. Mercy is one of those words that we just automatically associate with God. Love and grace and mercy. In one translation, 118 times the words mercy and merciful are found. Somebody gave this definition for, for mercy and how it's different from, from grace. You've, you've probably heard it. Uh, Mercy is not receiving what you do deserve, while grace is receiving what you do not deserve. I like that. And what it means is that mercy actually precedes grace. You don't receive what you should receive, but instead you receive what you shouldn't. Because God is merciful, then he gives us his grace. So if we're not giving people the grace that we should, then people, what that means is we're not experiencing the mercy that we should because you cannot give grace unless it comes from a merciful heart because if you give grace and it's not from a merciful heart then it's not grace well the fifth the attitude has an attribute blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy because God is merciful we're going to have to stop going through all of the Beatitudes, but you can see where we are going. When we think about the attributes and we focus on God's attributes, they should not just lead us to theoretical, impractical, ivory tower, sitting in the balcony Christianity. In other words, it should not lead to pew Christians. 
focusing on the attributes of God. We see, for example, Paul in Romans and Colossians and, and other things that, that, he, that he writes. He often, for example, in Colossians chapter 1 and 2 are theological and chapters 3 and 4 are practical. So he delves into who God is and what we have received before he even gets into how we are to practice all of that. That proves that theology precedes practical living as a foundation precedes the walls and the roof. But we, we don't always do that. What oftentimes we do is we want how-to sermons and books with step-by-step -step instructions, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we want to be competent Christians, but we want to do it without character. There is something wrong with that. And what is left out is how to do things without learning how to be like God. We cannot. You've got to understand this. I've got to understand it. It is impossible for me to practice Christ-like Christianity if I am not practicing who Christ is. It's impossible. Go back to that first one. Want how-to sermons. There are some people in, in our congregation that really just want, give me a list of things so I can see how to do it. Because I can't make the application, which is why I end every sermon now with application and assignment. Because I want to help them because they're having trouble connecting the two. Then there are other people who said, I really wish you wouldn't give us the application and assignment. So I can figure that out on my own. And that's good for them. Sometimes we need help, but you see, there's nothing wrong with needing help because that's exactly what we see Jesus Christ doing, his life. That's exactly what we see Paul doing in beginning his, his books with who God is and what God has done. For example, if we think being a parent in Ephesians chapter 5 has absolutely nothing to do with what we read in Ephesians chapter 1, then we need to go back and read chapter 1. There is a, a book by J.I. Packer called Knowing God. And I want to suggest that if you know someone better, then you're probably going to act a little bit more like them sometimes. You know when people have been married for a long time? You know, they can finish each other's sentences? It's like, you know, for example, if, if I were to say, Perry is, Janet would just say, awesome and amazing. <laughs> See, I can finish the sentence for her. I've known her that long. They say sometimes the longer uh, couples are married, they even start to look like each other. So there's still hope for me. <laughs> so if you know God, you'll be able to behave more like God. And in this book, J.I. Packer gave four characteristics of, of those who know God. Those who know God had great energy for God. You ever try to get Christians to do something? Maybe the problem is not so much to begin with that you know we just need to get people more involved. Maybe those people who are not getting involved need first to know God better. But that sounds insulting, doesn't it? But I think that's true. Those who know God have great thoughts of God. I've, I've said that I, I've got a degree in, in philosophy, and somebody in the past, some philosopher said that everyone who starts studying philosophy probably becomes an atheist at one point. And then if they keep studying philosophy, they become a believer again. And I've heard the same thing about science. You know, study science and it can lead you away from God. Keep studying and you just see God's hand in everything. What are your thoughts on God?
what he can do, what he won't do, what he will do, who he is, what he wants you to become. Do you have great thoughts about God? Or do we not even think about him? Those who know God show great boldness for God. I'm going to share with you a shameful time in my life. There's been more than one, but I'll just give you this one. I was at Western Kentucky University. I was in uh, one of the philosophy classes that I was, I was taking. And the professor asked a, a question about humans and God, and he said, can anybody come up with a way that humans are like God? And I'm thinking, this is a philosophy class. I'm surrounded by people who don't believe. I'm just going to sit here, and I'm just going to be, be quiet. And I still remember where I was sitting, on the left side of the classroom, which tells you how ingrained this is in my brain. And I sat there, and I did not have great boldness for God. Nobody spoke. And he said, I'm really surprised nobody said. And I'm thinking, that's what I was thinking. But I was too embarrassed. Which means I needed to know God more. You see, I've always been really good at going to church but maybe not as good as knowing the one who died for the church. And those who know God have great contentment in God. I know that's an entire sermon by itself. I like teaching more than, than preaching. And I shared with you at the beginning how, at least I use, curiosity and imagination in, in my studies. Towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, there's a familiar passage that I want us to look at maybe differently. It's the one about you know, asking, seeking, and, and knocking. But I want us to see if we can use this to challenge ourselves in how we study. For example, ask, that's technical, because in spiritual infancy, we begin studying the text, asking what the text reveals about righteousness. We ask, what does the text say? Is that an important question? Yes, absolutely. You cannot study without asking, what does the text say? Can you ask, what does the text say, without ever changing your life? Yes. You could even be an atheist and know what the text says. So ask what the text says. Let's go to the next step. Seek. It gets a little bit more personal. Because maturing, then we become self-aware of our own righteous inadequacies. And we're seeking to apply the text, studying both it and ourselves, revealing more of ourselves to ourselves. We ask, what does the text say? We seek, how does it apply to me? That's personal study. We need to go one step further. And we go from ask to seek to knocking divine study, where we start to approach spiritual older age. We begin to grow more enlightened and we begin to studying God in the text and ourselves, knocking on heaven's door, praying to reveal and be revealed. We ask, what does the text say? We seek, how does it apply to me? And we knock, how can I become more like you? That's divine study. 
So why these attributes? Why blessed are the poor in spirit and those who mourn and are gentle and hunger and thirst after righteousness are merciful and pure in heart and are peacemakers and persecuted for righteousness sake? Why these? Because the Beatitudes are a declaration of dependence. And it all begins on who God is. And we have to become like God. Amen? What's your one takeaway point? The Beatitudes teach us how to be complete, perfect, and fulfilled because they're teaching us to be like God in ways that we can imitate God. That's good. It's positive. What's your one takeaway point? What's your application and assignment? Jesus begins his sermon with the attributes of God as described in the Beatitudes, which means the Beatitudes are the beginning of the greatest how-to book ever written. I've got a, a book that's going to be, be published for new converts. And it's, it's uh, 49 different lessons for uh, new Christians, new believers. It has short little articles and then it has uh, some questions based upon the, the articles and it concludes with uh, a prayer suggestion based upon what they've been, they've been reading. And the very last lesson is now start studying the Sermon on the Mount because <laughs> you'll never get done. So it, it's not just a book and I've been trying to emphasize that through these lessons. It's very, very practical. And I hope that we can all learn to be like God. Where's the gospel? If you would, get your psalm books and turn to the imitation psalm. In just a moment, we'll sing. People today want to bring God down to our level in this way. By making Christianity just a life that's better lived with God than without God. Okay, now, I'll, I'll freely admit, if you follow all of this, you're going to be living a, a pretty good life. And I'll ask a, a question real quick. How many of you think that you're a better person today because you are a Christian? Okay. I know I am. I know I need to live with God in my life. But I need also to go beyond that and understand that Christianity is not just a life better lived with God than without but rather that Jesus wants us to bring us up to God instead of just bringing God down to us so that we're, we're living with him. Jesus wants us to bring us up to God so that we're living like God. There's a difference there. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus came down so he could lift us up to live like God. The Beatitudes are about who God is. That excites me. I need that. If you're not a Christian, I, I, I want you to understand that we're not just offering you a list of rules to live by. We're, list, we're offering you what God has offered, and that is to live like him be his son, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. If you don't know what to do, please come forward and we'll talk while we stand and sing.